So hi everybody, welcome to the Design Patterns Brown Bag Series. Um, I'm not sure exactly how often we're going to do this yet. Originally we were thinking once a month. Um, I'm thinking twice a month might be a little bit better, but I'll take a poll at the end of the session and see what people think, and we'll go from there. Okay, so uh, my name is Scott Stanchfield. Let me put that up here. I was going to be using my graphics tablet, but the uh, unfortunately the driver is not working right now, so I was going to write things on the screen, and this might actually be read more readable anyway. So. You probably win this way. Um, but uh, we're going to be talking about a series of design patterns that I used to teach at Johns Hopkins University for the Education for Professionals program. Yay! Um, I don't teach that anymore. We just didn't have enough uh, people attending to justify two instructors, so I bowed out. Um, I am helping the other guy set up the online version of that course. Uh, it's a great course. You're going to learn a lot of the same type of stuff throughout this series. Uh, I will be recording all these sessions. That's why I have the headset mic on right now. And I'll be posting them. I'll be posting them on my personal website, javadude.com. So if you just go there, let me put him in here. Uh, if you go there, you can take a look at the different videos and any of the source code that I post there. Um, now, what I decided to do, and I'm going to try it this time around and see how it works, and I may stick with it. Um, I've got the examples here in a Git repository on GitHub, and I will be switching through different uh, iterations or different uh, uh, revisions to show you different steps along the way here. Normally, when I'm teaching this for the, the three-hour sessions at Hopkins, I'd be you know actually typing code in front of you step by step so you get a little bit more detail. These are condensed sessions, so I decided I'm just going to go ahead and say, here's the next step, here's the next step, and talk through each piece. We'll see how it goes. Okay, so questions on anything before we get started? No, because I haven't said anything, right? That's the way it works. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to first of all talk about is the, uh, the general idea of what a pattern is. Okay, when you hear the word pattern, what do you think about? Sewing. Hey. Thank you. The perfect example right there. Sewing patterns. Now, of course, not everybody thinks about sewing patterns off the top of their head because how many people here sew? Not too many, right? It used to be a pretty common thing, but over time, we just go to the store and buy our clothes now. Uh, if you took a look at a pattern and you saw it and it looked kind of like a shirt, you'd probably assume it's a shirt, right? If you saw another one that kind of looked like pants, you'd assume it's pants, right? But what if you saw a pattern that just looked like a big square? This is where using the tablet to draw on the screen would have been nice. What do you think that might represent? What kind of piece of clothing would that be? Any ideas? All you see when you look at it is a square. Could be a handkerchief, right? Could be a skirt. Could be some kind of a uh, headscarf. It could be, you know, um, some kind of a uh, kilt. Any number of things. Just by looking at it, you, you looking at the pattern, you might not really be able to tell what it is offhand, right? But if somebody wrote the word skirt on the design packet, on the, the package for the, the, uh, the pattern, then you know what they're talking about, right? They've communicated their intent to you. So no matter what it looks like, you're now in the mindset of the person who actually was, was designing that pattern, right? And that's really the whole key to design patterns here is communication of intent. And this, I stress this like crazy when I'm teaching the class, that what you're really doing here is we're not showing you how to do things. One of the big things of this set of sessions is how to communicate more effectively between each other. Because we as engineers, if you write something up, chances are a lot of the things you're writing, people have done before, right? And in many cases, you've done them several times over and over and over again. And then when you try to describe to somebody else what you've done, it's going to take you 20 to 30 minutes to get them in your mindset, right? But if you can condense that 20 to 30 minutes into observer pattern, or if you can condense it into something like visitor pattern, just a small little phrase, maybe combinations of patterns, you can communicate more effectively. And somebody can understand what you're trying to do and how you design the app better. We do this for our maintenance programmers. Maintenance programmers are really, whenever you're writing code, your maintenance programmer is your target audience. What you write, you want to make sure that somebody else can pick up and run with, because you don't want to maintain it the rest of your life. At least I hope you don't. You want to move on to new things. You want somebody else to be able to pick up your code and run with it. And the quicker you can get them into your mindset, the more effective they're going to be at putting the right changes in the right places so that they actually can follow your intent. So the more effectively you can communicate that intent, the better. And that's really what I think design patterns are all about. 
Now, there's a bunch of formalisms behind them. I never get into the formalisms. The Gang of Four book, written by Gamma Helm, Vlicides, and Johnson, is a good book, especially if you're having insomnia. Okay, it's it's a it's a really 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 dry book. Great stuff in there. It's a great reference. But when I was reading the visitor pattern in there the first time before I understood it, my nose hit that page no less than 36 times. Um, but it's a good reference. If you want a really 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 good book on uh, design patterns, Head First Design Patterns is my favorite, and it's really the book I would have wanted to write. It's a really funny book, very engaging. It goes a little light on a couple patterns near the end. I'm going to do something similar, but with different patterns than they chose. But if you want a really good, good, oops, hide, head first. Uh, if you want a really good book to get some detail in design patterns and actually enjoy reading, that's a good, that's a good choice there. Um, so uh, it's not quite as formal as the Gang of Four book. The Gang of Four book says, oh, okay, we have these consequences, these benefits, and has all this very, very kind of almost mathematically spelled out. Um, I like to talk about it uh, more casually, more colloquially. Okay. So what we're going to talk about to start with is I'm going to ease you in by starting with some bad ideas. We're going to look at some, some code that is really, you know, it's, it's a way that people used to write code. And over time, people have realized there's better ways to do things. And so I'm going to start off with a really simple to-do application. We're going to walk through it, and we're going to start gradually improving it over time. And I'm not going to keep that same example the whole course, but I'm going to do it for the first few sessions because it actually works in pretty nicely for the first, first couple things we're going to work through. So to start with, I have a nice little GUI application here. Note the EW at the top there. This is very commonly what you'd see when people were writing GUIs in Java to start with. It's a big, long list of stuff to do. Basically, GUI setup intermingled with some actions. So if we start off up here, we're creating some widgets that we're going to deal with. We have a little list that we're going to display things on the screen. We have a text field, which is going to be for entering the to-do items. We have an add and remove button, which lets you add and remove things from the list. And then let's take a look at what those buttons are going to do. Now, I'm going to use lambdas in here just to make things a little bit simpler, keep the code simpler. Don't worry about what that means. If you want details on lambdas, go to javadude.com. I did a lecture on lambdas in Java 8, and the video is up there. All you need to know here is when the button is pressed, I'm going to say list, add the stuff from the text field. So we're going to take the stuff from the text field, stick it in that list. Now, this is a GUI component. Now note that my data and my widgets are one at this point. I'm actually using the widget, the list widget, to hold my data. That's a really bad idea. Very, very inflexible. Okay, why is that inflexible? What's bad about that? So one thing is if you want to get in your data, you have to dig in your GUI, right? That's a problem. What else is wrong with this? What else is bad about this? Uh, well, it depends on how you do it. You could work some validation in it. What happens if you want to change your GUI? Right now, this is written in AWT. This is old school Java here. Original Java here. And what if you wanted to enhance it to use something you know newer, like Swing, JFace, SWT, any of those types of things? You not only are changing your GUI, you're screwing with your, your data model, right? Your, all your data logic is baked into your GUI at this point. That's really bad. Any changes to the data could affect the GUI. Any changes to the GUI could affect the data. That's a big problem there. Now, when you press your Remove button, we're just going to remove the selected item from the list. Fairly straightforward, right? And that just looks like get the selected index from the list and call Remove. Now I'm going to set up just the GUI structure around this. So I'm setting up some panels here, and these panels are going to be a series of nested border layouts and things like that in order to organize the GUI. Basically what I'm doing is I'm placing the list off on the left edge, and then the right side is going to be another border layout where you have the text field at the top and two buttons at the bottom. So that's all I'm doing with this guy. Then I'm setting up my overall frame, adding in the stuff there, packing it so it just takes up a minimal amount of space, and then saying what to do when the user hits the close button. Okay. And then I make this thing visible. So it's a very simple little application here. Let's run it just to see what this looks like. And 
And here we go. Here's our little GUI. And if I type in some text there, we'll see that it's working. I can select something. I can remove things. And so on. Okay. So it's a nice, simple little GUI. But the logic and the GUI are all baked together. Okay. So not a great place to be on this. So we want to improve things a little bit. One thing we can do, and early on what people started doing when they're designing GUIs, is they came up with a couple different ideas for how to organize their GUIs. Some people went for an object-oriented approach. Some people went for a procedural approach. If we go for a procedural approach, we might have something that looks a little more like this. And this is actually an approach that uh, the code generator in Visual Age for Java used to do a while ago. And I kind of like this as far as code generation because it's actually really simple to read. You don't get that big blob of stuff printed out there. But what, what, he, what we're doing to start with here is setting up, here's just for each of our widgets, I have a variable, just a field in the class. And then what I'm going to do is for each one of those fields, I'm going to have a method to create it. And this is basically a lazy instantiation method. If you ever see something that looks like this, if something is null, create it, and then after, return it, that's called lazy instantiation. We're waiting until something is actually needed before we actually create it. So it's a last minute thing, and you're going to notice that every one of these methods in here, get list, if it's not existing, create it. Get item field, if it's not existing, create it. Create center paddle, if it's not existing, create it, and so on. And what's really cool about this is now the order in which these things call doesn't matter. The first time you call something, you create it. The next time you call it, you just return it. So something like this, when I say button panels add, create add button, I'm going to get that button if it's already been created, or I'm going to create it at that point and set the variable so that if anybody else wants to use it, they can reuse it. So something like this, get item field here. That's when I'm adding it, but down here when I'm creating my buttons, I'm also calling get item field and get list. So you see it's being called in two places. I don't want to create two copies of that thing, right? I just want to create it once and then use it the second time. So whichever one of these gets called first, it'll create it. The next time it'll just reuse it. And that frees me up quite a bit from the order of initialization. And that's actually a pretty good step. But you'll notice this whole thing is very, very procedural. So I'm going to create a frame, create a frame calls, get list, create center panel. Now, just as a little note, the get and the create here, I made different names on that just because I knew some of them are being reused. So the ones that are being reused, I explicitly put a getter on. I should have been more consistent on it, but I just wanted to call it out here just so you could visualize it a little bit better. And then he calls create center panel, which calls get item field, create bottom, create bottom, blah, 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 and so on and so on. So it's this big, nice, recursive uh, descent in order to create our GUI. And that works, right? It's fairly readable. It's fairly safe. You don't have to worry about the order of initialization and everything, right? But it's kind of spread out, right? So it's kind of hard to see the GUI. It's kind of hard to visualize the GUI in this case. Um, which is one of those places where I think GUI builder tools are actually kind of nice. GUI builder tools that you see the GUI, as long as you don't put the logic in there. When people start putting logic into the GUI in the GUI builder, then I got a problem with that. Um, but if you have a GUI builder and it generates code like this, that's great. And just as a by the way, I really don't like the idea of a GUI builder that generates code and then you modify the code. I think it should just strictly be think of the GUI builder as a higher level language. Kind of like when you write something in C. You don't go and tweak the assembly code that the C compiler generates. You just write it in C, let it generate. And that's the same way I think GUI builders should be doing. Now, people are moving away from GUI builders quite a bit now because they're going into a bunch of different languages and things like that. But if you work with a GUI builder, I like ones that are strictly code generation. Okay, so this is another approach. If we run it, it'll do the exact same thing as before. Just to verify that. And the GUI still looks exactly the same. And then we can remove things in here and so on. Something like that. So nice and simple. Questions so far? Now, some people like to take a really strict turn toward object-oriented programming. Now, there's 
when you think about objects, anyone know where object-oriented programming came from? No? Go back farther. It's a language called Simula. Quite a bit. I think it was around 67 or something like that. i got to look this one up at one of these points. And the idea behind Simula, what, what do you think Simula was a language for? Simulation. Okay. Now, that's kind of obvious, right? Now, let's think about simulation and think about object-oriented programming. What do you think, what, what you know about object-oriented programming, how is that so well suited for simulation? Think about objects. What do objects do? They do things for themselves, right? They have state and they have behavior. What do things in the real world have? State and behavior. You know, simplify it quite a bit, right? Okay. So for simulation, real basic objects where you really hide all your data is a really good idea, right? Because if you look at each other in the room here, we can't see each other's hearts or our innards. We can ask, hey, can I check your pulse? Or hey, tell me what your pulse is, and then we can check our own pulse and return it, that type of thing, right? Okay. But we can't just go and say, hey, there's a heart. <laughs> Rip the heart out and then look at it and see it beating. The objects are all self-contained. Okay. What do we call that? When you're hiding your data. Encapsulation, right? And that, I think, is like one of the key parts to object-oriented programming. I think it's the most important thing in object-oriented programming is encapsulation. And a lot of times people will talk about it as data hiding, right? I prefer to think of it as data protection. I don't have a problem with people knowing that you have data. I have a problem with people being able to blindly change it. I want to know my state. And I always like to tell a story about when I went to, to England. And uh, I've only been there once, and I was walking around doing some shopping. My wife at the time asked me, hey, can you go to Harrods and get me something? So I, I go to Harrods, and this is this huge shopping store. Line of people going into the store is basically, it looks like March of the Penguins. It's everybody kind of all squished together on the sidewalk, kind of waddling, going into the store. You do your shopping, and then this waddling mass comes out of the store at the end. So I go in and I bought her something. I come out of the waddling mass at the end. And just after I get out, I see a McDonald's. Now, McDonald's in, in the UK have fried apple pies. These are these things that, when I was a kid, were like the, the crack. I mean, it was the best thing in the world. I loved fried apple pies. And then at some point, McDonald's decides, oh, we need to get healthy and make them baked. And what do we know about baked apple pies? They suck. They're awful. So when I was in, in the UK, I had the chance to get these fried apple pies, and I loved it. I was in heaven. So I go into McDonald's. I order my Big Mac and my fries and two apple pies and a Diet Coke. And don't give me grief on the Diet Coke. It was for my teeth, not because I'm trying to do a diet. Okay. So I'm in there. I get all this stuff. She puts it on the counter. I reach for my wallet, and my wallet's gone. And I'm like, oh, crap. And here I am salivating with these fried apple pies right in front of me, and I couldn't have them. My wallet was pickpocketed. Somewhere along the line, and I assume it was during that waddling mass after I got out of Herod's, somebody picked my pocket. This is a huge problem. For me, at that exact moment in time, the reason it was a big, big problem was because I couldn't have my fried apple pies. That was my immediate concern, right? Now, had I known my wallet was gone, I wouldn't have even have gone through the exercise of going to McDonald's, right? I would have said, oh, I know my state. I know that I cannot do this operation. That's a problem. Now, if my wallet, now you notice, if you look right now, where's my wallet? Front pocket. Ever since then, I keep it in my front pocket. It's a little less likely to be picked there, a little bit more obvious when somebody bumps you in the front that way to, to steal it. Um, by having it in my front pocket, I'm protecting it. Now, somebody can still ask me for it, right? Somebody can come up and say, pardon me, may I have your wallet? But whose choice is it now? It's totally my choice. If I choose to let him have it, then I know my state, right? He's asked me a question. I can give it to him. Now, that question might be parameterized. He might be holding a gun, right? And if that's the case, I, my decision may be a little different based on the parameter, right? Okay. But in either case, I still know my state. 
I still know if I have my wallet or not. And that helps me be consistent throughout my life, and I don't go to McDonald's and start salivating and not be able to get my apple pies. So that's why encapsulation is important. Now, you can look, when you, when you take a look at me, you see this wallet bulging out of my pocket. You know I have a wallet, right? But you can't get it without asking me. That's what I call data protection. You can let people know, you can have getters and setters, but you are in complete control. And that, I think, is the number one thing about object-oriented programming that's important. Encapsulate, protect your state. Don't worry about hiding it. For simulation, I think that's perfect. For simulation, you want to hide. But how many of you write simulations? Once in a while, I see a couple of, This is actually more hands than I usually get up. We've got three hands, you know, a little less than half the people in here. Most of the time, one person's hand goes up or no people's hands go up. True simulations, where you're really trying to model the real world, really are not the most common programming task. You know, a lot of people, our task is, we write a web application. We write web, web services. We write a simple GUI like this. Those don't look like simulations. So trying to come up with an effective way to represent those is a very different problem. So sometimes traditional object-oriented programming, or think of, th think of things in terms of data hiding, isn't really the right approach. So keep those things in mind. So what sometimes people do is they tend to shoot over to object-oriented programming a little too hard sometimes. Sometimes they completely hide their data. Sometimes they decide everything has to be an object no matter what. And sometimes you can get something that is very compact, but sometimes very hard to read. So in this case, what I did is I switched this object, this, this program around so that the nesting structure of the GUI is represented by a set of nested objects, and each, object's, each object has been over uh, subclassed to have the specific constructions about how to build himself. So we get something that looks kind of like this. And what I'm doing is I'm using anonymous inner classes like crazy here. And each of these, like if you take a look at this one here where I say new panel, curly curly, blah, 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 and curly curly. Now, what is this curly curly doing? That looks like magic, doesn't it? This is actually valid Java code. Anyone know what the heck that curly curly is doing? Well, if I say new sum, new sum class open curly, I'm creating an anonymous inner class, right? So I'm creating a new subclass of panel there, and there's some guts inside of it. And the guts happen to be that stuff right there, right? Well, what is this curly? Can I actually have something like a curly like that? It's not a static initializer. You're close, though. It's just called a instance initializer. This is essentially a constructor. And guess what? When you're doing an anonymous inner class, you don't have a name, right? So this is what a constructor inside an anonymous inner class looks like. So the curly curly is actually defining a new class and a new constructor inside of it. And so I have code like this. So it kind of looks like magic, but it's not. It actually makes a lot of sense, but this is the way that some people will write it. Now, the thing that I like about this is the GUI structure is very, very apparent here just by looking at the nesting. You can see that I have a border layout with a west and a center. This border layout has a north and a south. This panel is a flow layout with this panel inside of it, which is a grid layout, with these two buttons. So you can see the structure. It's very, very clear. But how many of you understood this as soon as you saw it? Very few. I had to explain the curly curly thing, right? And the style that it's written in is, is a very different style than you're used to looking at. So this is something that you're shocking the maintenance programmer. And in general, I don't like to shock the maintenance programmer. Because the maintenance programmer is going to see this and say, I don't know what to do, and just rewrite the whole thing, right? Okay. Now, take a look at this guy here. Notice this little ending here, the curly curly paren semicolon there. Now, one of the things with anonymous inner classes that's really hard is... When you nest in anonymous inner classes, it's kind of hard to see the ending of an anonymous inner class. So what I like to do, and I do this in my real code, is put the closing curly curly paren semicolon on a single line like that. Because it's but ugly. And what happens when you see something that's that ugly? It makes your mind go, huh? It stops you. It's a very visual way of stopping the end of an anonymous inner class. And sometimes anonymous inner classes are hard to see inside code. Now, things are a lot easier now 
that we have lambdas. Once you get used to seeing lambdas, they're a lot cleaner to read. And you don't have to have anonymous inner classes all over the place. But if you ever create an anonymous inner class, that curly curl parent semicolon at the end can really help. So what we're doing here is we're putting the GUI into a form that's a little bit more logical looking. But at the same time, this is really hard for a maintenance programmer to figure out if they don't already know your style. Okay. Note that I'm still putting the actual what to do's inside the code here. So I'm still mixing my logic with my GUI construction. And we still have that same problem. If we change our GUI, we have a chance of breaking the logic. If we change the logic, we have a chance, chance of breaking the GUI. Let's just make sure this still works. And there we go. So it's still doing the same stuff. It's just a very different style of writing it. So this might be a knee-jerk reaction in the wrong way, right? So let's look at some other ways of doing this. Now, when you take a look at this piece of code here, one of the things that pops out is I have these buttons that I'm adding actions to, right? Now, if we were good object-oriented programmers, the button would do things for itself. That's what we've been taught in Object-Oriented 101. Objects do things for themselves. So instead of somebody telling the button what to do, the button should do it, right? That makes sense. Let's take a look at what that does. So now what I'm doing, let's take a look at a little add button here. So here's a little add button. This button here takes in a list and a text field. Those are the things he's going to act upon. And then he says, when I'm pressed, let me go ahead and add the item from the text field to the list. That makes sense, right? The button is doing things for himself. Let's take a look at the remove button. The remove button, he takes in the list, that's all he needs, and he does things for himself. That makes sense, right? It's beautiful, isn't it? Until you start thinking about it. Let's take a look at our GUI. And what I did is I'm, I kept the same structure of the GUI from that last example, but you'll notice that now I'm just adding these buttons that have the self-contained logic. So I'm no longer having the GUI tell the buttons what to do. That's a plus, right? The actual working logic of the application is now no longer in the GUI setup. And that's actually pretty nice because now I don't have to worry about if I change the structure of the GUI breaking my business logic. As long as I have the add and the remove button and the list and the text field, it'll still do the same action. Now, did you notice anything about that last sentence I just said? As long as you have the add and remove button and the list and the text field, the application is still going to work. Okay, well, that's assuming a lot about my GUI, right? Just to get my logic to work. And that's something that you want to try to make as few assumptions as you can there. Later on when we talk about model view controller, we're going to separate that out quite a bit so that we're not going to care what our GUI is to manage our data. But for now, we're moving in a better direction. We're starting to get some of the logic out of the GUI construction, at least. So that's a step in the right direction. But take a look at this Add button. What does this Add button depend on? What do you need in order for the Add button to work? You've got to have a list and a text field, right? That list in the text field are requirements for the add button. Eventually, we're going to make it so we don't care about that. But the button itself needs a list in a text field. How reusable is this button? Not very, right? So why have it as a class? That's where you got to take your logic to. The whole idea with a lot of little classes like this are things that are reusable logic. If it's not reusable, what's the point? I mean, look at what he's doing. He's really not doing a whole lot. That same thing was less code before. I didn't have to have this whole separate class, right? I just define it in the GUI and then add the stuff to it. So it seems like maybe I'm kind of going in the wrong direction really here. Object-oriented programming said I should do this, though. Have the button do things itself. Okay. 
But we've got to think a little more carefully about this. It's like, that's a problem. If we want to try to use this in the GUI, he has to have a list in a text field. Hmm. So, let's take a look. Let's run this again just to make sure he still works. Yep, everything's still working just fine. So let's see what's going to happen. It seems like we don't want to have the logic in the GUI construction, right? And we don't want to have the logic inside the buttons. Well, if it's not in one or the other, where does it have to be? Somewhere else, exactly. So we create a somewhere else. And we call this somewhere else a mediator. The mediator is responsible for managing the interaction between these GUI components. So the GUI components don't have to know about each other. And this is actually a nice step in the right direction. Let me get those out of there. So we take a look at our add button. You're going to notice the add button got a lot more complex here. But let's figure out what we're doing here. I wanted to make it so the add button doesn't care about the other widgets. So we take a look at this, and I added in a little interface here called Add Button Listener. And we're going to talk a lot more about listeners in the next session when we talk about observers. But the whole idea here is that I'm going to let somebody else have an interface called Add Button Listener. This is somebody who's interested in knowing that the Add Button's been pressed. And he's going to have a method called Add Pressed. And he's going to tell me, I'm interested in you, Mr. Add Button, by calling this set Add Button Listener. And then, when we're pressed, we're going to tell him, hey, the add button was pressed. So this allows somebody else to plug themselves into me to know when they've been pressed. And we'll go through that in a lot more detail next time. But you'll notice now that the add button only has one dependency, somebody who implements that interface. That's pretty flexible, right? You know, when I'm thinking about interfaces, I like to think about movie roles. Think about the Terminator. You have a movie role called the Terminator. And he has six lines. I'll be back. And you, your clothes, give them to me. That type of thing. Okay. He has several lines. I use Saracana. Those are, those are his lines. Now, when James Cameron wrote that, I don't know if he was thinking about Arnold Schwarzenegger or not. But the script had those lines. Did it have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger saying those lines? No, I mean, it could have been uh, Patrick Stewart. You know, your clothes, give them to me. It, it's, it, and it just really, it really wouldn't have the same effect, I don't think. Or Pee Wee Herman, for God's sake. I mean, that would be really bad, right? Ah! Uh, that would not be a good way to have that movie go. But could we have plugged Pee Wee into that movie? Sure, we could have him say those lines. The, the movie would have probably come out utter crap. But we could have done that. As long as he signs the contract to say, I agree to play the role of the Terminator. That's his way of saying, I implement that interface. Arnold Schwarzenegger signed the Terminator contract. He's implementing that interface. He has those lines to say. The script says, Arnold, say I'll be back. I'll be back. And then it works, right? That's the way everything works. You have this contract between the two players. So now all I care about in this ad button is somebody else is going to fulfill this contract. I don't care who it is. And that's a huge separation. Before, we said, you have to be a list. You have to be a text field. Now, hey, somebody who wants to know that ad's pressed, they can call me. That's pretty nice. And we do almost exactly the same thing. And almost exactly the same thing in the remove button. But the interface is called remove button listener. It has a method called remove pressed. Hey, that's pretty nice, right? So now let's take a look at what binds these guys together. In our GUI, we're going to create instances of our GUI components. And then I'm creating this guy called a mediator. Now note that I had to put a suppress warnings unused, because if I didn't, nobody is directly calling that mediator guy. All I'm doing is holding on to him so that he can manage the components. And the mediator is going to get passed in the stuff that he manages. And then he's responsible for hooking them up and making them play nicely. 
So let's take a look at a couple mediator designs here. So here's a really, really simple mediator that implements those two interfaces. So he's the one saying, I'm going to fulfill the contract of the add button listener, remove button listener, by having add pressed and remove pressed methods. Then when I'm getting set up, I'm going to add myself as the button listeners for those two buttons. Makes sense, right? So when the add button is pressed, add press gets called, and I'm going to do that list add. When the remove button is pressed, remove pressed is called, and I'm going to do the remove from that list. Make sense? So now that logic is no longer in the button, so the button's a lot more reusable. That add button can be reused in any GUI that wants an add function, as can the remove button, right? This mediator is something that each application will have separate. So now you're not putting in your GUI um, interaction logic with your GUI construction logic. That was the advantage to this pattern. We shifted it out. Let's take a look at another style of mediator here. That one's a lot simpler, isn't it? Instead of the mediator implementing the contract, I'm passing in lambdas again. So now when the add is pressed, I'm going to call list add. When remove is pressed, I'm going to call list remove. So I'm actually creating a couple extra objects to do the actual listening for me. And I think this is a little bit cleaner because the mediator doesn't implement those interfaces. Now think about this for a minute. This mediator implements these two interfaces, right? Who can use this mediator class? Anybody can take this instance and plug it into an add button or remove button now, right? That's not our intent here, is it? Our intent is that he is managing all these as a black box. We don't want the outside world to be able to use him for anything other than that. We just want the outside world to create an instance of him and uh, pass, the, pass the GUI components in so he can manage them. If we have this add and remove button listener implemented, Anyone on the outside can say, ooh, I've got a mediator. Let me hook into this add button, which totally gets rid of what the mediator was trying to accomplish here. He's not managing his own internal state anymore. Somebody else is plugging him in somewhere where he didn't want to be plugged in. Be really, really careful on this implements clause. As soon as you put implements, it's telling the outside world, you can use me as one of these two guys. That's dangerous. You'll see this a lot of times. People will have this thing where inside of a class they set up some components, some widgets or something, and then they implement interfaces and say, add listener this. Be very, very suspect of any code that says, add listener this. And I see this a lot in Android code where people will have buttons set up with a say, set on click listener this. That's very, very dangerous because now the outer class can be used in other scopes where it wasn't intended. Anytime you see some add something with a this, think about using an anonymous inner class or a lambda there. Don't implement the interfaces because now you're going to be outscoped. Make sense? Okay. So that's why I prefer this style of doing this mediator because now he's managing everything and you can't abuse him somewhere else. Now in the GUI, what I've done is now the GUI doesn't have any of the logic. And the buttons don't have any of the logic. That's a nice separation there. So now we have our list text field add button remove button. We're setting up our mediator just to manage them. And what would happen if instead of putting this field in here, I had in my go new mediator one with all the stuff inside of it. What would happen if I did that instead of having that field? Would it work? Would it get garbage collected? Hmm. It's a tough call, isn't it? Let's take a look at that mediator here. Would the mediator get garbage collected? Uh, 
Let's see about either of these. So let's say Mediator 1. Let's start with him. Would Mediator 1 get garbage collected if I just said new Mediator 1? Okay, so the answer there is no, because the reference to it is being held by the Add and Remove button. Add and Remove buttons are explicitly pointing to it as listeners. How about Mediator 2? This one's a little trickier. Kind of boils down to how lambdas are implemented under the covers, doesn't it? If a lambda gets implemented as an anonymous inner class, which it does, with some extra plumbing around it, but if it does, then there's an implicit this pointer pointing back to the containing instance. To make that a little more apparent, a little more obvious what I mean, if I say add button dot set add button listener, this is just with a, a traditional anonymous inner class. Whoops. What is he doing here? Just need to import him? Yeah. This is creating a new object that is a non-static inner class inside this class. Another way to write this is if I had private class my add button listener implements add button listener and whenever you have an inner class that is non-static he has an implicit pointer to his containing class that allows him to get at variables so I could have inside my outer class I could do something kind of like that. And that compiles perfectly fine because that inner class has a pointer to the outer class so he can access his data. But if I made this guy static, boom, notice how X is not visible anymore. I no longer have that pointer to the outer class. Now it turns out with lambdas, I have similar functionality because I can actually access Uh, did I do something wrong here? Oh, I need a semicolon. There we go. I can access the data. So it must have a pointer to the outer class, right? To be able to get at that X variable. So, again, our mediator won't get garbage collected. But how much confusion did that just cause? When I asked the question, you had to think a lot about it, didn't you? I would much rather, in my GUI, have this field here that makes it very, very obvious that I'm hanging on to this guy. Then rely on people understanding that this is not going to get garbage collected. Because a lot of people would look at this and say, wait a minute, I'm not doing anything with that. He's going to get garbage collected. So be explicit on things like that. Make it obvious to somebody what's going on. Okay, make sense? Okay, so... Okay, so now let's take a look at, well, remember those add and remove buttons there? Let me go back to here for a second. The add button and the remove button were almost identical, right? What's really the point of having them now? I'm creating extra code just to have two separate listener interfaces on this. I might as well just go ahead and say, you know, merge them back down, make them just a button, and let the mediator do the explicit adds to each of them. Because if I look at that mediator 2, which I preferred anyway, I'm just adding a lambda to listen to each of those buttons. Do I really need separate interfaces anymore? The separate interfaces aren't buying me anything. It's just a single method being called. And especially when you're using something like a lambda, all you care is that it's a method with a single or sorry, an interface with a single method. You don't care about the name of the method. I'm saying do something when the button does something. So this code here is functionally equivalent to add action listener with the exact same lambda. 
except the lambda takes a, a parameter. So if I come out here, whoops, and I come back to this newer version here, now you'll notice I've gotten rid of the add and remove buttons because they weren't buying me anything. And then in my to-do GUI, he looks the same. I just say mediator equals new mediator, blah, blah, blah. But the mediator, instead of calling those set add listener and set remove listener, is just calling add action listener on both buttons. So now I've saved myself a buttload of code. But I have the exact same functional effect. And so now we're down to a very simple mediator at this point. Make sense? So the whole point of this first section here, we went from a GUI where we were merging in all of our code that did the construction of the GUI with our code that managed the data. We were intermingling that. It was a big spaghetti ball, right? And that was dangerous because now if we change either the setup logic or the business logic, something else can break. This is a step in the right direction. We've moved the business logic out into the separate mediator class. We're still using the widgets to hold the data. I don't like that. But we're going to get to that point where it's not going to be as big a deal. We're going to eventually start teasing that out more into separate objects. Now what you're going to see is a big running theme throughout a lot of these patterns is separation of concerns and abstraction. Sometimes the abstraction can be a little bit abstract. How many people here are comfortable with the visitor pattern? How many people know what the visitor pattern is at all? Okay, so that's very telling right there. And because of that, it's one of the reasons why later on I'm going to tell you, avoid the visitor pattern like the plague. Now, actually, how hard is it to avoid the plague? Although with all the anti-vaxxers nowadays, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, avoid, there's certain patterns that if it's hard to figure out the, what the pattern's doing, you really should avoid it. And the visitor pattern is one of those that's really hard to grok. And we're going to go through learning how to work it and how it actually works. Um, that's several topics down the line. Um, but some patterns, I think, are just too complex for their own, con own good. And some of them really aren't necessary anymore. I mean, that was one that was, that was generated because there was no runtime type identification in C++. So we couldn't figure out what an object is. We had to trick the system. And it's a great trick. I mean, visitor pattern is a fantastic trick, but it's a trick. It's a hack. And we're going to see that I think that that's more of an anti-pattern now than a real pattern. Um, but every once in a while you're going to see it in real life because some people think, oh my god, this is wonderful. And those people are a little insane. Um, but because of that, you're going to see it. And I want you to understand it. Okay? So throughout this, this, this course here, you're going to hear a bunch of names. You're going to understand what they mean. And that's going to actually help you be better engineers, I think. Okay? Now a lot of these, you've probably done. You've probably done a lot of these patterns. Maybe you didn't know there was a name to them. That was always my favorite thing when I did an interview with people, is I would talk them through a design for something and have them tell me how they would implement it. And then I would ask them, what pattern did you just implement? And they would stare at me with this blank look on their face. And they would start thinking, oh my god, I just failed this interview. And I'm like, that, don't worry about it. The whole, the whole thing with design patterns is just, it's just we're just throwing a name on it. You did it. You did the code. You came up with a good design. You just didn't know that there happened to be a name for it. What's really funny is half the time they would just take a guess. Uh, visitor? Uh, singleton? Because <laughs> they'd heard these names. Oh, just a little note. Whatever you learn in here, if, you, if you're in an interview for anything, you know, whether they're putting you in front of a sponsor to, to try to convince a sponsor that we should do some work, um, if the, the person interviewing you asks what design patterns do you know, never say singleton. Always pick something else. I mean, I don't. I think singleton's a fine pattern. Some people have a huge problem with it, but if that's the first one that comes out of your mouth, people are going to kind of discount you quite a bit. You know, pick something interesting. Say, you know, decorator, adapter, composite. You know, if you know what it is, <laughs> don't use those words just because I just threw them at you right now, right? Okay. Um, but uh, you know, and you know, by all means, after you've attended these sessions, on your resumes here at Hopkins. Put in design patterns as one of your skills. That that's a great buzzword, and after the session, it, after these sessions, it won't just be a buzzword. You'll understand them, and that's something that actually can give you a lot of street cred. Okay, any questions on anything?
Okay, so hopefully you found this useful as a start. Um, let's, uh, I'm trying to decide, you know, when, I, how often I want to do these. What would you guys prefer? How many people think twice a month? Once a month. <laughs> two and two. That's helpful. Um, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll juggle it around. I think what I'll do is I'll throw a poll up on, on maybe the Java users group or something. Um, how many people here on the Java users group on Cooler? <laughs> two people know about the Java users group on Cooler. On Cooler, there's a, uh, a group that I started called the Java users group. I'd recommend everybody join into it. I post announcements on there once in a while. And there's other, you know, it's a great place to ask Java questions, things like that. Um, there's also, and anybody know about the software development list on a listserv? Okay, we got a few more nods out of that. That's a little old school, but it works. It's just basically, you know, email messages. Um, there's also a Java users list on the listserv as well. So you can sign up for those. Um, I'm trying to come up with some ideas for um, company-wide, coming up with some better communication means. Because trying to find out about sessions like these, there's just so much data out there, being able to whittle down what you're interested in. What I want to do is I want to set up a server that everybody can register interests. And, you know, I, I hate to use um, uh, Yahoo's early tree structure as a model, but I want to use Yahoo's early tree structure as a model. You know, something kind of like that where you can say, I'm interested in software, which has a whole bunch of subcategories, or you could more specifically say, I'm only interested in Java. I don't care about MATLAB. I don't care about C++. I just care about Java. So you can kind of hone in on which topics interest you. And then when people post calendar announcements, they can attach topics. And then you'll get notified when things of your topic of interest come up. That way you, you can have a little bit better filtering. That's, that's what I'd like to do. Um, I brought it up with a few people. I'm just trying to find the right people to talk to about it. That's the challenge with this place. Um, so hopefully we'll come up with something along those lines. Um, and I'm open to ideas on that as well. I mean, I, th I think, you know, things, you know, improving communication here would be fantastic because, you know, everybody's got so much to say and I would love to be able to know which people to go and hear their talks, you know, random talks. But I'm glad you guys found, how did you guys find out about this? What's that? So the Central Spark Cooler Group. Okay, good. And did people find out from any place else? Just the Central Spark one? Your supervisor ordered you to, yeah. Go supervisor, yeah. Excellent. Um, anyone else? It was mainly Central Spark then. Excellent, excellent. So I'm, I'm glad that that's working. Um, that's one of those things. It's like, you know, there's just so many little pockets of information. You know, hopefully we'll find other better ways to communicate as well. Okay. So keep listening on the Central Spark. We will announce when this, the next one of these sessions is. And I will also announce when um, uh, this stuff is posted and where to get it. Um, I'm planning on putting it, if you go to javadu.com slash articles, it should be somewhere underneath there. I'll probably just have a page that says design pattern talks or something like that. And then I'll put the code, or at least the links to the, the GitHub, and um, the, the pointer to the video. Okay, any questions? Okay, hope to see you all next time. And tell everybody else this is wonderful so they'll come. <laughs>